Now, uh, Mr. David Makura is addressing the delegates. Let's cross over live to that conference taking place in Irene. Movement here in Gauteng. Uh, Comrade Tokyo Sekwale is going to join us in the course of the conference. Comrade Matole Mutsecha is here. Professor Mutsecha, let's welcome him with a big round of applause. Uh, that's the former leaders. Comrade Obed Mapela will also join us. Uh, Comrade Mohamed Dango will also join us. Comrade Njimu Tsecha will also join us. Comrade Nomvula Mukonyani was here earlier on, fresh from KZN. She hadn't slept there, so she was here earlier, so we must bear with her. Uh, we also, as I say, we have a former chairperson of our province, who is now the TG of our organization. I want to acknowledge, together with the TG, we elected in our National Executive Committee former PEC members. Uh, Comrade uh, Barbara Chrissy was acknowledged earlier on. Uh, Comrade uh, Gwen Ramukhupa was also acknowledged earlier on. Comrade Ngondi Gungubele is now here. Uh, Comrade Nkenkeke Kana, they are all here. They are coming to bid you farewell. Let's give them a big round of applause. You have sent them to the National Executive Committee these comrades. Comrades, I want to, on that note, thank all former leaders of our organization for their contributions to building Gauteng into a respected and admired province that it is today. Our province is a respected and admired province in our movement. We are honored to have taken the baton from these leaders as this PEC over the past four years. And I want to say that even the incoming PEC must promise that it shall do everything in its power to keep our province united. As the current generation of leaders and as this leadership that's outgoing and the leadership that will be incoming we are humbled by the knowledge that we are heirs. We are descendants of militant struggles of non-racialism, of the African National Congress of the Transvaal, of the South African Communist Party and Communist Party of South Africa, of the progressive trade unions and civic movement, of the women and youth organizations of the Transvaal, the PWC and Houghton province today. Our province prides itself as being the revolutionary laboratory that produced and shaped the political consciousness of some of the finest freedom fighters in South Africa. And amongst them, we count Sefako Mahatu, Charlotte Manye Matweke, Silo Petema, Dr. A.B. Kuma, Dr. Yusuf Dadu, J.B. Max, Nelson Mandela, Oliver Tambo, Albertina Sisulu, Walter Sisulu, Ruth First, Joe Slovo, Lillian Ngoi, Florence Muposho, Peter Nkite, Dan Tome, Helen Joseph, Solomon Mashangu, Rahima Musa, Amina Kachalia, Beas Nodie, Betha Kowa, David Bupape, Ahmed Katrada, Isu Chiba, Winnie Mandela, and other departed leaders of our liberation struggle. We are deeply humbled to know that we can be seen and heard because we truly stand on the shoulders of the giants of our liberation struggle who placed the Transvaal, the PWV, and Houghton province at the center of the liberation struggle in our country over a century. As we meet here in July 2018, we carry the onerous burden of emulating the example of men and women who dedicated their lives in pursuit of the most sacred and most sublime 
of all human causes, the liberation of humankind. In his opening address to the ANC's second consultative conference in Kabwe, Zambia in 1985, President Oliver Tambo said the following, and I quote, this is a council of war. Gathered here are professional revolutionaries, military commanders, commissars and cadres, diplomatic representatives, trade unionists, workers, peasants, royal persons, intellectuals and students, men and women. In this wall are present revolutionaries from all national groups of our country, united by a common and militant resolve to ensure that the 1980s do indeed become a decade of liberation. Our people want freedom now. They want to govern and determine the destiny of their country today and not tomorrow. They have lost patience with all ideas that their liberation can be postponed for any reason whatsoever. And we who are gathered here are the trusted sons and daughters of our masses, close quote. Comrades, with the benefit of hindsight, we know that the Kabwe 1985 consultative conference played a key role in helping the ANC to regain the strategic and tactical initiative and to maintain the moral high ground over the enemy, which was the apartheid regime. The ANC emerged from that 1985 conference more united, rejuvenated, and determined to take the struggle to a new level. This forced the regime to seek a negotiated transition to democracy. Comrade delegates, as we gather here at this conference, the 13th Provincial Conference of our, of our movement in this province, we can say without fear of contradiction that the people of our province want radical socio-economic transformation now and not tomorrow. They have lost patience with the pious declarations and empty slogans. They don't want resolutions and plans that are not implemented. They are impatient for fundamental change that brings real and sustained improvements in their living conditions. The people of our province want decisive action against corruption so that all public resources are directed towards improving their own quality of life. They want transparent, clean, and accountable government now and not tomorrow. As we gather here, we must also invoke the spirit and advice of Amika Cabral about the masses. And I quote, always bear in mind that the people are not fighting for ideas, for things in anyone's head. They are fighting to win material benefits, to live better and in peace, to see their lives go forward, to guarantee the better future for their children, close quote. This provincial conference will demonstrate the fact that the people's concerns, the people of our province's socioeconomic problems are the principal focus of the discussions and the decisions of Houghton's conference today. The 14 million residents of our province are awaiting the decisions of this province conference with bated breath. I want to assure the people of our province that everything that worries them shall receive the attention of this conference of the ANC. The state of the economy and jobs, crime and corruption, education and health, housing and access to land, women and youth, the cost of living, the e-tolls, transport problems, water and electricity problems, waste management problems, potholes, as well as access to con connectivity, particularly the vexing question of the cost of data. This is all what this conference is going to look at. These are the issues facing the people of our province, and we must emerge from this conference with a solution.
We in Gauteng are very happy that the 54th National Conference has set our movement on a course to self-correction. There is no turning back, comrades, forward ever, backward never. In communities where we live, many people who had turned their back on the ANC are returning to our movement in large numbers. Our people are once again proudly associating with the ANC. The masses are responding positively to the corrective steps being taken by our national leadership collective to restore the integrity of the ANC and various state institutions, which were severely compromised by state capture. Recent polling data shows that the ANC is steadily regaining public confidence amongst our people. There is renewed hope and a much more positive mood is prevailing in our country and in Gauteng at the moment. However, we must not be complacent. We still have a long way to go to regain full confidence of our people. The social and economic situation, especially the escalating cost of living, can be a serious drawback to this positive mood in our, in our country. Comrade delegates, it is therefore urgent that this conference builds on the positive momentum sparked by our 54th National Conference. Again, I want to repeat that there's no turning back. There's no turning back to an era where, as a movement, we spend too much time focusing on our own internal problems instead of focusing on how to help the people to win back material benefits, to improve their own lives and guarantee a better future for their children, as Amika Cabral would have said. Accordingly, the Provincial Executive Committee has decided that the theme of the 13th Provincial Conference should be unity, integrity, service, and renewal in the, in the centenary of Nelson Mandela and Albertina Sisulu. The, this theme calls for us to remain true to our mission of uniting the people of our, our country, uniting our movement, and upholding the revolutionary values that our movement has always cherished. To be always at the service of our people and to work hard to renew our movement and the state for the success of our national democratic revolution. So as we gather here, comrades, as the true sons and daughters of the masses, as Oliver Tambo would have said, we must extensively discuss and promote the four cardinal points, and those four cardinal points, again, is unity, integrity, service, and renewal. And on the question of unity, I want to turn attention now to deal in a little bit more detail and in some historical way with why unity is so important in the life of the ANC. The question of unity is first and foremost the unity of the African people and black people in general. So united in their great majority behind the ANC and the broad democratic movement. Therefore, the unity of the black majority should always find expression in our organizational and mobilizational work. At the same time, the question of unity is dialectic, dialectically connected with the question of national unity of the South African people, black and white. So comrades, when we talk about the unity of the ANC, when we talk about unity in the ANC, we don't only talk about the unity of the ANC as an organization. We do so because the role of the ANC and its principal task is to first unite the African people who are divided along ethnic and tribal lines, and then unite all black people, and then unite all South Africans. And the ANC cannot unite all South Africans if it cannot unite itself, if it cannot unite its alliance, if it cannot unite the broad democratic movement. So that's the first question why unity is important. It's not just about conferences, it's not just about whether we are contesting or not, unity is something that we must always engage with and understand. 
Organizational unity must also be understood in the broader unity of the people of our country around a program to build a united, non-racial, non-sexist, democratic, and prosperous society. So in our articulation of the vision of the ANC, we always start with unity. So we say a united, non-racial, non-sexist, democratic, and prosperous society. In that place, in our vision, unity cannot be put at the end. And there's very good reason why we always start with unity. Because apartheid divided our people. Apartheid divided us. And the task of the ANC is to unite the people of our country. So we also, in this pursue national unity and nation building, again, towards a single South African nation. So the quest for national unity in our revolution proceeds from the understanding that at a particular point in our history, we emerged from what Comrade Thabo Mbeki characterized as two nations in what we now call South Africa. On the one hand, we had an oppressor nation in the form of domestic white, a domestic white colonial minority linked with the imperialist forces. And on the other hand, we have an oppressed nation which was subjugated to, to apartheid colonialism. The reality of the oppressed nation or the nationalities that had to come together to unite to face apartheid is something quite fundamental to what was later characterized by our revolution as colonialism of a special type and the movement and strategy against it. The mission of our, our movement is to build one nation. We have to pursue this, this mission of building one nation, taking into account that in this one nation, there shall be diversity of cultures, of religions, and other identities. Even as we talk about unity in our organization, we accept that there will also be diversity of views and differences even on on position issues of leadership. And those differences will never and must never subtract from the pursuit of unity. On the contrary, we continue to say, talk about unity in diversity wherever we are able to articulate this. So from its inception, comrades, the ANC sought to unite the people of our country, particularly Africans, against colonial conquest and disposition. It grew into a force that was able to unite all the oppressed, democratic-minded, and freedom-loving South Africans, regardless of na na the national group to which they belong. President Oliver Tambo explains the importance of unity amongst the oppressed. And I quote, the African people are the most oppressed and exploited people in South Africa. They are the basis for our struggle for freedom and the most reliable force in our liberation movement. By they are, but they are by no means alone in this struggle. The Indian people are today faced with economic ruin as a result of the Group Areas Act and other legis legislation. Like the African people, they have no political rights whatsoever. The colored people face as they have done for many decades, racial humiliation and exploitation. These people are part and parcel of the oppressed majority in our country. And their destiny is inseparable from that of the African majority. Their place is alongside the freedom fighters against apartheid and colonialism. And our policy will be to secure unity in struggle amongst all the oppressed people, close quote. So even as we come to this day, the unity of all national groups in our country at this point in the history of our country is very, very important. We have to continue to make sure that the issues of equity, redress, and social justice are, are tackled for all the erstwhile oppressed, the Africans, the colored people and the Indians. They all have to be at the center of our nation building social cohesion and radical socioeconomic transformation effort. 
We must never allow any section of the oppressed to be left behind or left out of the initiatives to improve the quality of life of our people. As President Nelson Mandela argued during his seminal statement on the dock, we are against white domination and we are against black domination. We are for non-racialism. We are for inclusive, progressive nationalism. The biggest challenge we face, comrades, is that quite often the character of our own movement from branches, regions, and even provincial level does not always reflect these non-racial traditions of our, of our organization. That's the first fundamental problem. When we say the ANC needs to be an embodiment of the unity of the oppressed, this has to be seen in the character of our organization. The second problem is that our socioeconomic programs, particularly in government, often fall short of impacting on the well-being and quality of life of all national groups. As you know, that you have given me another responsibility, a responsibility given to, to me on behalf of the ANC by the people of our province. As the Premier of Gauteng, I've also come across evidence of serious neglect of some of our communities. And this includes underinvestment by government in the colored communities of our province. Comrades, I want to repeat this. There is evidence of neglect if you look at government programs that we are under investing in communities, a section of the community, uh, uh, communities which who were oppressed and not, we're not doing a, a very good job in this regard. This neglect, particularly of the colored communities, has far reaching consequences for our project of nation building, social cohesion, social justice and equity. This neglect cannot continue because the consequences of this neglect, particularly of underinvestment in the colored communities of our province, is the following. The levels of crime and drug abuse in the colored community has skyrocketed while the standard of living, including education, has gone down, and this is the evidence from Statistics South Africa. Both poverty and unemployment have reached extreme levels in the colored community, and this has bred resentment and anger. I often hear when we go in our government programs, people in the colored community saying to us, ons was nie wet genoeg. No, ons es nie swart genoeg. I often hear that from them. These are ordinary people in the communities who would point to concrete evidence of, so, of neglect by government, whether it's issues of housing, infrastructure issues, or investment, in the revitalization of these communities. As the ANC, we need to hear this cry and respond appropriately. I would like to call upon ANC-led government, municipalities, and departments to act decisively in correcting the neglect with regard to the revitalization and investment in infrastructure, including ensuring that education and health Housing delivery takes place in all communities, especially all the communities which were oppressed under apartheid. Let us change the face of all these communities as we are putting an effort to change the face of the African townships. This brings me to the second question in our theme. On, that is the question of integrity. Throughout its history, the ANC leadership Cadres and members have upheld the core values and ethos of selfless service, sacrifice, solidarity, integrity, honesty, and hard work. It is this that has enabled the ANC to act 
as a moral voice and force for common good amongst the oppressed when we were fighting against apartheid and colonialism. These are the foundational values of the Freedom Charter and the Constitution of our Republic. All ANC members are bound by these values. And these are the values, again, of selfless service, sacrifice, solidarity, integrity, honesty, and hard work. During these different phases of our struggle, the ANC also had to confront tendencies that sought to erode these values. This was done through a combination of two means at least. How did the ANC confront the tendencies to erode its core values? Firstly, the ANC invested heavily in the political education and training of its members. Secondly, the ANC enforced political and organizational discipline in its ranks. You can't deal with the erosion of core values just by going to, in, by talking about discipline and dis sending people through disciplinary processes. Yes, disciplinary processes are important, but we have to educate people to say they understand what it means to belong to the ANC to be a leader of the ANC, to be a cadre of the ANC. So this combination of enforcing discipline and investing in political education is again something we are called upon to do. But we know that our ascendancy into power combined with the, the enduring dominance of the profit motive market excesses have also led to a situation of growing and grotesque inequality and poverty. So we are pursuing revolution in an environment where some people have a lot and others have nothing. We are pursuing a revolution where the market, the values of the market, are impacting on the core values of the ANC. And this is increasingly impacting on the character of our organization and the orientation of the members and cadres of our own movement. This is not justification for acts of corruption or moral or ethical lapses. The critical reality, comrades, is that unless we challenge also the architecture of a system of dog-eat-dog, Unless we challenge the, act, the, the foundations of a capitalist system where it is okay for others to thrive whilst others are left out, where there's a justification that we can't all have something, it must always be others have and others don't have. Unless we challenge those foundational bases of building a new society, we can all keep counting on our individual uprightness, but the environment around us of dog eat dog, and capitalism justifies the, the morality of dog eat dog. Your neighbor may not have food, it is not your business, as long as you have food. Your neighbor may be homeless, capitalism preaches that it is not your business, they must make it in the market. Unless we challenge those values, we will not understand why the, the values, the core values of the ANC themselves are under attack. So when we deal with issues of corruption and ethical lapses of our cadres, we must also know that the environment there about driving big cars, about big houses, and about others having all the money and other, some not, no money, others having us. That environment must be tempered with by the national democratic state. We must temper with that environment. We must insist that we can't build a society where some have and others don't. We must insist. The basis for corruption in our society is because a climate exists where it is justifiable to have everything when your neighbor has nothing. 
we have to challenge those values. So when we deal with the question of integrity of our cadres, integrity in our organization, we must also challenge the integrity of the socioeconomic basis upon which we are pursuing our revolution. We must challenge the value system of greed and capitalism. It is not enough just to be good, kind-hearted, and be ethical on your own when your environment every day is unethical. It's not good enough. We must challenge that unethical environment as we educate and cultivate the values that the ANC wants every one of us to have. So comrades, as noted by the ANC stalwarts and veterans in the document for the sake of our future, that document was published last year, as you know. I quote what the stalwarts and veterans say. We have observed the ill-begotten wealth among some of our leaders at all levels and the resulting ruinous effect on the organization's moral and political fabric and on society as a whole. We have watched as the leadership of the ANC became mired in a cycle of infighting occasioned not by the ideological or political differences, but by personal interest, close quote. The ANC's own internal research has also pointed out that corruption is a matter of great concern to ANC members and citizens alike. In Gauteng province, in 2014, corruption was amongst the top three major concerns of the people of our province. Corruption was the, the third coming after jobs and employment, and the second being housing. The third major concern was corruption. And this was demonstrated in the quality of life survey carried out by the Gauteng City Region Observatory. Comrades, in our province in 2014, people said the following, that corruption was getting out of control and it constituted the imminent danger to our hard-won democracy. This is what people said in that quality of life survey. They said corruption was getting out of control and it constituted a real threat to our democracy. So the 54th National Conference responded overwhelmingly and called for immediate and decisive action by the movement in dealing with all these issues, including restoring its own integrity, the integrity of the state and various institutions in society, including the integrity of business and the private sector. So as a province, comrades, we must take part in this effort and take a lead in cleansing our movement of any corrupt practices. We also need to lead by example to promote where we are in government. In a municipality or department run by the ANC, let's also make sure that there's ethical and clean governance. And let's act decisively whenever it is brought to our attention that there's someone in the system who may be doing something that is inconsistent with this value, value system that the ANC has championed for a very, very long time. There should be no room for us to, 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 to leave this not attended to. In any ANC-led administration in the Republic and in our province. And comrades, we know that the ANC Part of the response of the ANC has, to be, has been to institute integrity committees. But again, we need to go beyond that and say the issue of ethics and training must be part of the political education curriculum. Now, comrades, I want to repeat this. Many, many of our members who come into our organization often get deployed in various positions, some of them by virtue of their qualifications are in government. Some of them come from places where it, it was normal just to do things in the way that 
doesn't question whether the decisions are ethical or not. We have to cultivate amongst all our members. The issue of ethics and integrity must be something we bring into the training of our leadership structures. We must, it, I said to you earlier on, if we just use the blunt instrument of discipline and firing people, but we are not educating our members, but we are also not pointing to the dangers of avarice, greed, and avarice surrounding us. If we only do one thing and don't do both, there will be very few left. You know how a church works. A church works like this. You've got to invest in making people to believe that this is the place that will take you to heaven. Yes. Because the, the day they no longer believe this is a vehicle to take us to heaven, they won't come to the church. The ANC needs to see itself as an organization that socializes and preach people about the common good and that ethics and integrity and honesty and hard work, working hard to earn what you are earning, that's good enough in society. That has to be part of the political education program of the ANC. If we only focus on the one side, which is the blunt instrument, let them commit mistakes and then they shall be killed. Who want to contribute, but if somewhere in the system they fall, they are tripped and they fall, we must be able to catch them. Catch them and re-educate them and rehabilitate them and show them the way that this shouldn't be the only way. Greed can be challenged and it can be avoided. We have to invest in that amongst the members of the ANC. So that is that when we deal therefore with issues of integrity, we have to be comprehensive, comrades. So this brings me now to the third cardinal point, and that is the question of service to our people. So all these things that the PEC says the incoming PEC must do and how we must deal with them includes this third cardinal point. And that third cardinal point deals with the importance of the question of saving the people. Now, like with unity, we say, where do we come from with this question of unity? Integrity. Where do we come from with this question of integrity? So we ask ourselves, service. Do we just talk about service because we are in government, because there's service delivery? No, there is a history and there is a reason why the ANC deals with the question of service like this. Let us restate once more the, the historical truth that the ANC does not belong to ANC members alone. The ANC was formed to unite and serve the people of South Africa. We, the members of the ANC and the leaders of the ANC, are just servants of our people. We are just the custodians. We take care of this vehicle of our people. That is our, we look after it, but this vehicle belongs to the people of South Africa. We need, they need this vehicle to achieve their dream of liberation, of true freedom. They need this vehicle. If we break down the vehicle, it means we are holding the people back. So we need to renew the pledge that we shall dedicate our energies, our skills, and our talents to enable this vehicle of our people to fulfill its role of being a leader of society. We need to rededicate ourselves that as members of the ANC, wherever we are located, so we may not be in the next PEC, but we need to rededicate ourselves as members of the ANC, as revolutionaries, trusted sons and daughters of the masses, that we shall always use all our talents, all our energy, all our skills 
to continue to ensure that the ANC serves our people. And to do that, we don't have to be elected in the, into leadership positions. If I am not elected at this conference, I shall continue, and I know the men and women who are here, these PC members who are here, even if they are not elected into the leadership out of this conference, I can tell you, many of them are committed to continue to dedicate their skills, their talents, and their energy to serve the people of our country. And it is for that reason that being elected or not being elected is not the be all and end all in the ANC. The be all and end all is being given an opportunity to serve. Being given an opportunity to serve our people is the most satisfying thing. And we can serve our people whether we are in leadership structures or not. And this is an ethic that we need to teach to all members of the ANC, especially younger generations. So in one conference you may be elected, in the next conference you may, you may not be elected. But you can't be angry that you were not elected and then you walk away. Our internal research also points out that people love the, people love the type of ANC that is more open with them, more frank with them, and more honest with them. Our people, our research tells us that when there is a problem, our people want to hear the ANC being honest with them. Our people don't like an ANC that promises things that it cannot do. Our people don't like the ANC to be a typical political party. You just lie to the masses so that they elect you, and then after that you will come back and lie to them. Our people want the ANC that is frank and honest. Our people also want an ANC that's not arrogant, that is not incompetent, that is not corrupt. We must always frankly admit our own weaknesses. You know, one big thing about South Africa is that it is the ANC is the only organization, a party, and movement in South Africa which talks openly about its weaknesses. ANC processes are open. South Africans know what we are debating in the ANC. They even know how we elect leaders. Other parties hide everything from the masses. Other parties are preoccupied with a media image. In the ANC, when there are divisions, we don't hide those divisions. We say we must deal with them. In the ANC, when there are problems, we don't hide them from the world, from the masses, not even from the media. We acknowledge their problems and we deal with them. And that's what the people of South Africa loves about the ANC. Tell no easy victories. Tell no lies and claim no easy victories. Amika Cabral, tell no lies and claim no easy victories. So our councillors, our MPs and MPLs, MMCs of the ANC, mayors, MECs, the premiers of the ANC, ministers, we must never lie to the people. If we can't do something, we must say we will not be able to do this but we shall make a plan, and we shall consult with you. That's an important value, because we can't serve the people with distinction unless we are very honest about what we are capable of doing and what we are not capable of doing. So comrades, so this question of service, let's deal with another part about service. We will not be able to serve our people well and acquit ourselves well unless the ANC has the caliber of people deployed to those service points who have the experience and the skills and in some instances even the qualification required by that service point. I know I need to repeat this. We will not be able to serve our people and acquit ourselves well 
If we don't have the caliber of members who have the experience, the skill, and in some instances, even the qualification to do the work at that service point. And the PEC was saying in our discussion of the political reports that imagine in, in 1978, if the ANC had given Solomon Masangu an armory, an assortment of weapons without training him. Imagine if we called people Kedas of Umkonto Wesizwe, we gave weapons to them without training them on how to use those weapons. Why is this question important? So it is important that the ANC members must have the technical education, the organizational experience, and the ideological training that's relevant to equip them to lead the people of South Africa and serve them well. It is important. It's a fundamental requirement. We will not lead our, serve our people well if we just, you just send me there to fly an aeroplane, but I've never been prepared to fly an Who will get into an aeroplane fl flown by me anyway? Who can take a risk amongst you here? Who is bold enough to can walk into an aeroplane flown by me when I have never been trained and prepared to fly an aeroplane? But this is what we are doing sometimes. Sometimes we are doing what Walter Sisulu called endangering the revolution. Some Walter Sisulu said, we conducted ourselves when we got into government in a way that endangers the revolution. And one of the ways of endangering the revolution is to assign comrades who simply because they come from our movement, to give them responsibilities above their level of competence. And we call that CADA deployment. There's no such CADA deployment. When comrades are given responsibilities above their level of competence, there will be a yawning gap. They will fail not only the ANC, they will fail the masses. It doesn't matter how good they are, they are hard. It, they may not be bad people, and they don't want to fail. They want to succeed. But if they are not properly prepared and appropriately trained and properly equipped to fly the aeroplane, it shall collapse. So comrades, we are raising this question, therefore, that this provincial conference, in the context of the decade of the CADA agreed in Mangaung, this provincial conference must pay attention to the need for Houghton to increase a critical number of CADAs who have the relevant skills, the relevant experience, and the relevant qualifications to help us execute the mission of saving our people. This must be one of the resolutions that in Gauteng as we are going to have a plan on this question. Because what often people call, people call and our opponents attack us and say this is CADA policy of, there's no such a CADA policy of the ANC where we, are, we give people who have never flown an aeroplane to try and fly an aeroplane. That's not CADA policy. Because firstly, a CADA is somebody who, who has been selected, systematically trained, and prepared for a particular mission, for a particular role, and after which they are assigned to that role. Selection, preparation, training and assignment to a particular role. That's what makes you to be ready as a CADA. If you have not gone through that, you can call each other CADA, CADA. Hey man, CADA, how are you? <laughs> My CADA, I like you. CADA. 
you are a cadre of what? <laughs> and some even say commander. <laughs> now, you see, when you talk of commander, it's another level of being cadre. And another level of not just training and preparation, now experience in battle now. You have been trained, prepared, and assigned a mission. When you acquire experience in battle, you come back, you get, get assigned. You don't just assign commanders who cannot lead the forces. So comrades, in a big way, we have behaved in a way, as Walter Sisulu says, that has endangered the, the revolution. But we know the ANC has never met somewhere and said, Prof. Matole, that we must appoint so and so who doesn't have the skills. It's not, but we do it and we make those mistakes as leaders. We get pressurized. We ourselves want to do favors. You get somebody who is a, a very good mathematics teacher appointed to run a hospital. There's something that's called misdeployment. So this cadre is trained, is prepared, but must be assigned to something that has to do with mathematics. Sometimes we get the best cadres and destroy them by assigning them to wrong places and wrong positions that have nothing to do with what they were trained and prepared for and they shall fail, and they shall fail to serve our movement, and they shall fail to serve the masses. If they are assigned to something they were not prepared for. That's why in China you never get deployed as a minister or a diplomat assigned to a country or anything un unless you, get, you have been taken to political school, even if it's for one month. If you are going to be assigned a position, you get a debriefing. You get told, now we are taking you out of this, we are assigning you to that. And there, there are new challenges, there are new landmines. Because sometimes we make our comrades fail, not because they want to fail, not because they are bad people, but they are assigned to areas where they have no adequate competence, if sometimes to even make complex decisions. And this is to behave in a manner that endangers the revolution. And that undermines the ANC's capacity to serve the masses. So comrades, this question of service must go with proper training, selection, identification, of members. Not all positions always require a degree. And I want to emphasize this. It, it, is, it has to do with what is that level of competence required for that. But we must never abuse the word deployment when we are just giving people to responsibilities that have nothing to do with their level of competence. In fact, correctly speaking, that is CADA mis misdeployment. It's not CADA deployment. So I want to get to the third issue that the political report deals with, comrades, and that is the question of renewal. So unity, integrity, service, and renewal. So this conference of the ANC coming out after the 54th National Conference must deliberate on the state of our affairs, of our organization, from branches, regions, and the province, and the capacity of our organization to serve our people with integrity, to unite them, is the central reason why we need to, to renew the ANC. <clears throat> so the president was saying earlier on that every branch of the ANC must immerse itself amongst the masses. So the question we need to answer is how are we going to be able to lead the communities and serve our people if we don't have a proper organization? And many of you know when we were in the regional conferences on behalf of this leadership that's here, we came to speak there on the importance of organization. So organizational renewal starting point 
is to deal with the question of organization because it's organizational renewal. And what is organization, comrades? It is important to understand, and these are the classics of our movement. It's important to understand organization from the standpoint of Govan Mbeki. And he defines organization as the ability to solve the problems of our people or help the people to solve their problems. So what is organization? The ability to solve the problems of our people or to help the people on the ground to solve their problems. Because they have problems, they have aspirations, they want, they want a better life, they want to raise their children, as Amika Cabral has said, they want to guarantee a future for their children. So to assess the organization, we always have to make the reference point whether we are immersed in solving the problems of our communities. So comrades, we, we go at length to show that if we want to renew the ANC, one of the things that happened in the history of the ANC is that there are many occasions that the ANC had to reorganize itself. Be to answer the question, are we organized? Because if we are not organized, or if we can't solve the problems of the people, we may be a structure but not an organization. And a structure can be a collection of individuals who look busy. But busy with nothing. Busy with nothing that impacts on the lives of our people. We want to be an organization. We don't want just to be a structure. A collection of individuals going up and down. So in his presidential address to the ANC Transvaal Co Provincial Conference in September 1953, Nelson Mandela, who was the president of the Transvaal at that time, said the following to, our dele to the delegates at that time, and he was talking about the M plan. He said, our regional conferences in Sophia Town, in Jamiston, in Clip Town, and in Binoni on the 28th of June, 23rd and 30th of August, as well as on the 6th of September, 1953, were attended by large crowds. And they, this was a striking demonstration of the effectiveness of the M plan. And the National Executive Committee must be complimented for it. He went on to say, I appeal to all members of Congress to redouble their efforts and play their part truly and well in the implementation of the M plan. He said they must do the hard, dirty, and strenuous task of recruiting members and strengthening our organization by doing house-to-house -house work in the house-to-house -house campaign in every locality. And he further said, from now on, the activity of Congress sites must not be confined to speeches and resolutions. The activities must find expression in a wide scale of work amongst the masses, work which will enable them to make the greatest possible contact with the working people. And he explains in great detail what the M plan was about. So at one level, when we talk about organizational renewal, we must also always take a step back. What is the critical task of that moment? where in the 1950s, the ANC was reorganizing itself, preparing for the tough time of being banned. Some of the veterans who are here know that directly. And it was renewal at that time was about how is it going to survive and save the people even if it is banned. The end plan was about that. We also know, comrades, coming out of the 50, the 54th National Conference, as well as the 53rd, a, the conference in Mangaung, that the ANC says renewal is something that must help us to meet the challenges and demands of the current moment. So this provincial conference must develop a plan. We had resolutions from NASREC, but we need a provincial renewal plan, comrades. And we must execute such a plan with the energy 
and dedication that the ANC regions and branches in the Transvaal in the 1950s implemented the M plan. So we need, the National Conference said, a year, we, going ahead, this is a period of renewal. We need a plan of renewal that will help us achieve making the ANC an effective leader of society. Whether we are in government in an area or we are not in government, the ANC must always be an effective leader of society. And this brings me to the point, comrades, that we can, renewal must also address laziness in our ranks. We take resolutions, but we don't implement our resolutions. We adopt policies, but we don't implement those policies in a disciplined way that helps us reflect on the lessons we have learned and whether the policy is working or not. We keep introducing, testing this and testing that half-hearted implementation of our resolutions and our policies. So this provincial conference must also say, every decision we have made, we shall implement. And all resolutions of the 54th National Conference must be implemented in Gaute. Every branch of the ANC to test whether we are organized or not. A branch must show us what it has done to implement the resolutions of our National Conference. Even in government, I want to come to government because those of us who have been given an opportunity to serve our, our people, to serve our people deployed by the movement in government, we also know, comrades, that there's also no disciplined implementation in government. Uh, the, NEC, the NEC member who was not here, the former deputy chair of Gauteng, Comrade Nongvula Mukonyani is back. Let's give a big round of applause. I explained that you, you were sleepy, Imam Kizi. Yeah, I explained why you needed a little bit of sleep. So, com comrades, it brings me to this question. Every conference of the ANC we go to, the fundamental sickness in the ANC is that we don't implement our resolutions. Even in government, and I'm saying those of us who are in government, even the political people, there's no disciplined implementation of government programs in government. It is, all, it is true, comrades. We introduce new programs all the time, and the officials themselves, once you try to hold them to account, for example, in Houghton, when we just talk about one thing called the township economy, or Tsepo 1 million, when you try to hold every department and every senior official accountable to what are you doing on that one program of the ANC, they'll give you lots of problems. There is no disciplined Im implementation of policies and programs of the governing party. And we allow the officials to get away with murder. I think we must blame ourselves, comrades. The A when the officials employed to do government work and implement government policy are allowed to, be, to dodge and they are just busy somewhere else all the time. When you want to hold them accountable, where are we with this thing the ANC said we must do? Dodgy answers. This undermines the ANC in a very big way. So in other words, comrades, our organization, so we also need a capacity. If we are to serve our people well, renewal must equip us with the capacity to enforce our decision. If we say expropriation of land without compensation is the policy of the ANC, it must be implemented by everyone who is there on behalf of the ANC. And I'm giving an example. There are many policy decisions. Sometimes we allow those of us who are in government to go and change ANC policy in government. 
So our organization, so we part of building a, an ANC that can effectively govern and deliver is the discipline of policy implementation. So, so this brings me to another important question. So when we measure the success of renewal, we need to check whether the ANC is now impacting a branch or a region or a province is on top of its game in leadership to the people of that branch, that ward, or that municipality, or that province. In other words, if we are committing to serve in the, in the ANC leadership structures, we need to assess the impact of our work on our people. And this is in line with another, another important classic by one of the leaders of our revolution, Moses Kotani, who is known to have said and warned the ANC at his deathbed, revolution ikibat, meaning revolution is the people, warning if the ANC is isolated from the people, it must forget. The, an interpretation of the same dictum, Revolution Ikibatu, by Fidel Castro, who says revolution is the science of the masses. In other words, comrades, we can call ourselves we are involved in radical socio-economic transformation, in revolution, but if this work we are doing is not impacting positively on the people, that cannot be called revolution. And that cannot be called a transformation. Because revolutions are not for revolutionaries, but they are for people. And as we mark the centenary of Albertina Sisulu and Nelson Mandela, we have to take the ANC back to the people, as the president was saying. And one of the, the, one of the campaigns that offers real prospects is Tuma Mina campaign. And there is a, the NEC members, and there's a discussion about to what extent are we getting to Mamina to mobilize not just internal ANC people, to mobilize society as a whole. Because the ANC was not formed for itself and its members. So let's, let's broaden our work and the way we have conceptualized Tumamina, let's broaden it to allow to mobilize other South Africans of goodwill, bring them to the table to help us deal, solve the problems of our people as an ultimate measure about organization. So comrades, this takes us to a point you will see later in the organizational report, the provincial secretary is going to present to you what the PEC regards as the assessment of the character of the ANC in Kauti. I, won't want, I don't want to give you details of that, but there's research that was just done by the Office of the Provincial Secretary. That research points to the following decisive positive things. The first thing it says is that in branches of the ANC, 57% of those in leadership are women in BECs. I want you to hear me. That research says in BECs of the ANC, branches have gone to more than 50% on average. Now, I know you are thinking about your branch now. I know you are thinking, but you know this is the law of averages. So, your branch may not be, but many, 57% of the branches have, have, have they are, they are above the 50% of women in the, in the BEC. Isn't this a beautiful story of the ANC on the ground? That we are dealing with, we are bringing women into the political life of the branches of the ANC, leadership of the National Executive Committee. Isn't this a beautiful story? In time of depression, in time when women face an assault and an offensive, of gender-based violence? Isn't it a beautiful story that the base of the ANC, the basic unit of the ANC, the base, even the activists, the majority of the activists in branches are women. 
When you come to campaigns of the ANC, the people who give the ANC that human face and that human touch, I must also add women and youth. Uh, the youth, I know you are there too. But Luna, you always need to be polished and guided by the women. Your energy is very good and it's needed. I know there are many young people in our campaigns, but it is a beautiful story of the character of the basic unit of the ANC. The second thing is that coming out of that research, it says 70% of the branches of the ANC understand their words. This word profiles very well. 70% of the branches of the ANC know we are in this area. The problems of the people in this area are as follows. And 87% of them have at least tried to take up one campaign to try and address the problem. So the majority, 87%, have at least tried to say in this, in this world we have people, people have a problem of dirty water in Hamanskral that the branch, the, they have tried to do something about the problem. And a large number focuses also on service delivery issues. But where is the problem? The big problem is that most of our branches don't have the skills, they are not, they, we are, they are, there's no induction, there's no training by us, provincial and regional leaders. We are not investing in them so that they can help solve the problem. So what do they do? They are chasing problems, they've identified the problems, but quite how to get those things sorted out. They don't have the, they are not properly equipped. We are not investing in our branches to enable them to be the custodians of solving the problems of our people. The other problem is that because of the scale of unemployment and poverty, the majority of our branch leaders, especially in the townships, are people who are not in proper formal employment, majority of them. So they are susceptible, because they live precarious lives, they are susceptible to many things. They, many of them are hassling, they are just Bazama, they are just trying to keep things going. So they cannot focus their energies on the organization because a lot of time, half the time, they are really hustling to put bread on the table. And this comes to impact on the fights in the ANC. So comrades, I think it is very important that we move forward. Organizational renewal must address the fundamental question of how we strengthen the basic units of the ANC with the requisite skills for them to be able to serve our people, to unite uh, our people and serve with integrity. This takes me to the basic organs of the ANC, not the detail, the basic orga organs of the ANC, the leaks of the ANC are also important organs of the ANC. The leaks, the women's league is an important vehicle of the ANC to reach women to organize them, to win them over to the vision of the ANC, but also to lead the struggles facing women around gender, around patriarchy, gender-based violence, sexual harassment, reproductive rights, discrimination in the workplace, access to jobs, housing, and the fundamental issue of representation of women, as well issues of education and health. So in Gauteng province, one of the important things is that we, we need, the organizational report will tell us about the state of the Women's League. The political report says to us, what, what we need to do, comrades, is to continue to invest in the, in the, in the, in the development of women leaders in our organization, working with the Women's League. So one of the proposals we are making in this organizational, in this political report, is that the ANC in our province needs to, to emerge from this conference as part of the decade of the CADA. With what, with the, what we call the Albertina Sisulu Young Women's Leadership Program, as a way of dedicating dedicating ourselves to the legacy of Albertina Sisulu. 
we must have what we call, we must launch the Albertina Sisulu Young Women's Leadership Program, which focuses on recruiting young women and training them, giving them the experience to lead in all sectors, not just in the ANC. And this includes taking these young women amongst the tal most talented of them. We must take them to the best universities in the world. You remember we go back to skills, we go back to cadre preparation. You, we, can't, we can't give them responsibilities tomorrow if we don't equip them with the skills today. So comrades, what we therefore need is that, because this, if this is the ANC decision, that we need the Albertina Sisulu Young Women's Leadership Development Program. Part of what we need is how the ANC government turns this, where it is governing, into a wider program, not just young women in the ANC. So because if we don't invest in young women into the future, we will have no women who are not leading the ANC. We will always have an excuse. And this is often an excuse that, no, the women are not ready. And I'm told that it's men who say that. Secondly, about the youth of the ANC. The ANC Youth League has a responsibility to champion the interest of young people, young people in the ANC, young people in society, to organize them behind the vision and program of the ANC, and to place their issues at the center of the ANC organizational and governance program. And this includes unemployed youth, young professionals, young entrepreneurs, students in higher and post-school education. So the second thing we want to propose about the youth, remember the, the youth, investment in the youth is very, very important. So the ANC, we say in the incoming PEC, must also work with the ANC Youth League to rejuvenate the ANC Youth League. Pamili, Youth League, Pamili. Uh, where are you, Youth League? Are you here? Yeah, the Youth League was sitting there. PEC, where are you? The PEC of the Youth League. Not, no, you are not PEC of the Youth League. You are too old. So we're suggesting, comrades, that we must also develop, come out of this conference with a program that we should call the Anton Limberde. The Anton Limberde Youth Leadership Development Program. And that the custodians of this program must be the Youth League of the ANC, but it must be an ANC program. We, and in this, we must do the same. Let's, I, we need a youth league that is energetic, that has got, that's able to attract the most talented young people in all fields, train them politically, and make sure that they participate in the transformation of our country. And I want to raise a controversial issue, because when you are a leader, you must be bold to be controversial. I don't think the ANC needs a youth league of tired young people who don't have energy, who are tired by katele, abana, abana energy, abana vibe, aba, aba radical, aba ambitious. They are not going for things. They behave very much like adults. I want to be controversial. I don't think the, youth, the ANC, TG, I don't think the ANC need another organization of old people called a youth league. Like you, you are tired a little bit, you know. So these leaders who are here used to be in the youth league. Comrade Joe Maswangani was the deputy president, the TG Pemi. That a youth league that has energy. The first thing about the youth is energy. It must be impatient, it must be radical and it must want things to happen. And it must bring energy and renewal in the ANC to push things to happen. <laughs> the, 
That's the kind of, but we also need a youth that is educated in today's times. The most educated, we must attract amongst the intellectual youth. Bring them into the youth league of the ANC like we have in the youth league of the, the Communist Party of China. The most talented and educated young people in China and in Cuba are found in the Young Communist League. We want our youth league to have the most ambitious. Many of these old people who are here, we know. We know, many of you know. Our children say, but hey man, so youth league, you have a big challenge. Give us energy, please. We are old. <laughs> Don't bring tiredness, man, in the ANC. <laughs> so the, ki the caliber of youth league we need in Gauteng, you are going to a conference. Let's feel you. Sometimes we will be uncomfortable. It's in our nature. But when you are pushing things, pushing things to happen, the issues, programs that must improve the quality of life of youth, then we can feel you. And I must say, that includes when you criticize us, ne? Hey, man, there's shy, man, there's better. But it is good when you are doing that to, in the interest of pushing programs that affect young people. So we need that. We do need that. Uh, and this is an issue we have raised with comrades in the regional conferences. So that's important with the youth. Let's, let's renewal of the youth league must ensure that this youth league can help us to renew the ANC. The youth league is a source of energy and renewal, but also of radical ideas, new ideas all the time into the ANC so that the ANC does not become moribund and just sticks with the past. So it is important, comrades, so the key, the last area of renewal is the alliance. The renewal of the alliance is important. The president dealt with this issue of what was discussed. And in our province, the alliance is functioning fairly well. At a provincial level, we have problems at a lower level. The organizational report will deal with that detail. What we need at a higher level is a program to have consistent, proper political relationship, not personal relationship. An alliance driven by a program and political relationship, uh, including dealing with these issues. The alliance is very assertive lately. The alliance says we want to be part of everything. That what is called reconfiguration, that we don't want to be observers. So the organizational report will deal with that detail and therefore, comrades, I want to say that in this organizational report, we also deal with the balance of forces, and the balance of forces, we deal with them in this particular way. The ANC is on the resurgence. There is no doubt about it. Since the 54th National Conference, we are clawing our way, way back. We are on the resurgence. The president made this point very clear. We are on resurgence. The people are believing in us again. But we must also know that in a province like Houghton, things are a little bit more complicated. This is the economic hub. The electorate is more, is more discerning and more critical. If we make mistakes here in Houghton, which may be tolerated somewhere else, we get punished very, very quickly. We have a younger voting population. We also have a significant working class that is very well organized and conscious. So even amongst the working class, they are very critical. If the ANC doesn't do the things they believe in, we get criticized severely by the working class. We have a black middle strata that is also a significant force. They too look at us. And if the ANC doesn't do the things that they are happy with, we get criticized and they may even abandon us in that regard. So which means, comrades, that we operate in a very complex environment. We also have a media. We are the headquarters of the media. Opinion makers, and they are here. You can see them. They are here. Hello, media. And hello, media. We are the headquarters. Everything we do gets reported quickly, quickly and easily. Something bad happens here is in the news. Sometimes something happens in the periphery of Limpopo, the province of my birth. It gets to the news next year. 
in Gauteng, it gets to the news now. So we also have to be alive. We need an organization that is alive, uh, Comrade Pule, in our ability to manage the media. We need a capacity as in the ANC in the province to be able to constantly engage with these opinion makers in a way that puts the best ideas and policies of the ANC forward. So this is also important for the caliber of leadership we need. We are not a place that is sleeping. We are a place that is constantly on the go. From an election point of view, we know 2009 elections, we, we got the highest votes in absolute numbers, 2.8 2 million votes in 2009. That's the highest, whereas in 2004 we got two-thirds majority, but in absolute numbers we got more votes in 2009. From 2014 we started dropping, we dropped to 2.5 2 million, and we know in 2016 we even dropped more in 2016. To one, we got, only got the votes between 20, 2011 local government in 2016 local government, we, we also dropped. We dropped nationally, we also dropped in terms of provincial elections. And these things are also important, comrades, when we analyze what we need to do. Again, our voter population is more discerning, it is more critical, it's also youthful, more educated. So we, we got to find the best instruments to in, to engage with this voter population in the way we govern our province and in the way the ANC operates and responds to the needs of our people. But we know everything points to the fact that since NASREC conference, the ANC is, is coming back with a bang. The ANC is connecting with the people again. And I want to use the Ipsos again Ips, the recent June Ipsos research tells that same story. The president was, was talking about it. We want to talk about it again. That even that research says Gauteng province, the ANC in Gauteng is doing fairly well. But we want to say a big but. We must not be complacent. There are many problems, social and economic problems, facing our people on the ground. We spoke about those issues earlier on. Immediate issues, the question of e-tolls, the, so, the cost of living issues, unemployment that's not receding, particularly amongst the youth. Increasing problems about, around housing and our ability, because of migration, our ability to, to deal with the housing backlog. The only advantage we have is that our opponents are very disorganized. And we talk in this report about the DA. This I want to share with you, that we assess the DA in Gauteng as a party that is in disarray. Because the first problem is that the DA is trying to mimic the ANC. Everything they are trying to do is to try to show that they can be a better party of Nelson Mandela. Everything, they are not original. This, this, they are not, this thing is not original. If Hong Kong, it's not the, of, of original. They are trying to be a better ANC, but there's no way they can be a better ANC. As they do that, they isolate and alienate their liberal and conservative social base who dislike the ANC with a passion. As the black caucus of the DA tries to be a better ANC, their white, conservative, and liberal social base feel alienated. They themselves say, but this DA we no longer do. You remember what they used to say? They used to say, I safani ANC. But you know what? It is the supporters of the DA who are saying, I safani DA. It DA yaga musi my man, I safan. Ne DA yaga Helen Zile and Tony Leon. They have these contradictions in, um, in, the, in their ranks. They can't hold them together. And the tensions between black and white members about others wanting to pull in the progressive direction and others wanting to retain the, the, the DA as the party of white privilege. These tensions are overwhelming them. They also 
are failing to show that in Gauteng province they govern better than the ANC. We can also see in other places. Here in our province, comrades, Johannesburg and Swanee, the townships are worse than they have ever been under the DA-led administrations. They are trying to project themselves as a party that, is, that, that functions on the basis of competent people, but they have scandals about of appointing unqualified people. They are trying to project themselves as a party that is efficient in dealing with issues, the water crisis in Cape Town, the water problem in Hamanskral. There's this continuous disruption of the supply of electricity and water in Jobek and Swani due to poor maintenance are the things citizens are experiencing now. The Patricia Delil saga has actually exposed major contradictions as well in the DA. The DA also has got this image, they have an identity crisis. On the one hand, they try, they don't want what happens in the DA to be known. Everything, including how they elect leaders, is shrouded in secrets. I said to you, the way the ANC elects leaders is known by everybody. Their electoral process, when they announce the results, they don't say who got what, how many votes. Can you just imagine in the ANC when we announce the results of a conference and you don't know who got how many votes you just announced? Can you imagine it, comrades? I, he is, I'm telling you. If an electoral commission comes to announce the results and says the following have been elected, but we can't tell you how many votes the other person got. For those just joining us now, these are live visuals coming from Pretoria in Irene at the 13th Gauteng ANC elective conference. Gauteng Premier there, David Makura, giving the political report at that conference. Nabakura reporting on the need for unity, integrity, service to the people and organizational renewal in order to effectively lead and serve the people. Mentioning their view of the past, the struggle heroes are Bettina Sisulu, uh, Joe Slovo, Lillian Goyi, Rahima Musa, Bez Nadir and others saying that they have the responsibility as today's leadership to serve with integrity and selfless passion of these past leaders. Now, Makura, they have started as being the preferred candidate for the party's provincial chairperson position, one in which he is currently acting, saying that if is not elected at that conference, so well, it will not mean the end of the world to him because he will still have the need to lead the people and that and him saying there that that's what it means to be part of the people's ANC.